Good morning, everybody. Hopefully you had a wonderful weekend. Uh, we've got a lot of information that should help you um, get better at getting better. Two things, two skills we want to work on today. One is, uh, well, if I can make my computer work here. One is, how do we become or get uh, people to like us even more than they already like us? And the second thing is, how can we memorize things better? I know that a lot of guys struggle with scripts and things like that. How can we learn or memorize things better? So we're going to talk about what science tells us about both of those things. So the first thing we're going to talk about is being liked. So the golden rule, why do we want to be liked? I mean, what's the, well, the golden rule of business is all things being equal, people will do business with and refer to business to those people who they know, they like, and they trust. So let's talk about how they do this. And um, this gentleman, Graham Norton, he's phenomenal, how Graham Norton becomes the undisputed talk show king. This guy's in England. He's an Irishman, but he's in England. And if you ever want to watch him, he's on BBC America. And uh, this is the number one show that uh, um, authors, actors, musicians want to be on. And the reason they want to be on his show, it's not, it's not Jimmy Fallon, it's not uh, Jimmy Kimmel, it's not any of those. It's, it's Graham Norton's. They, they fight to get onto his shows because they love being on his show. And it's because they, they like him so much. So it's saying A-list celebrities flock to late night Graham Norton show. So why? Why do they like him so much? And I stumbled on, I stumbled on a uh, video that walked through the four things that he does to be liked. And what you're going to notice is some of these things are the things that I've been harping on for, for 19 years. So I just did it... Um, uh, instinctually, but now there's, uh, uh, th he does it, and actually I say instinctually, I did things instinctu instinctually, but I found there's a lot of science behind it, but but Graham does a lot of the same things that uh, that I've been uh, promoting. So we're going to watch this little video uh, from a guy who actually walks through the four things that makes everybody love him so much. So here we go. Graham Norton has what many people would consider their ideal charisma for two reasons. Okay, can you hear that okay, guys? Uh, I don't have my chat box up here. Yeah, okay, good. Yep, everyone's reasons. One, you don't need to hug the box in order to shine. And two, he seems to have the ability to make anyone like him. From rock stars to movie stars to professional athletes, people from all walks of life seem to love being around him. By the way, this is the best time I've ever had on the talk show. Oh, so today we're going to talk about a four-step formula that Graham uses to make people love him even when he teases them, and how you can use it to make yourself both funnier and more well-liked. The first thing that Graham Norton does with every guest on his show is create a warm, positive connection. Graham uses three main elements very early on to establish this warm, friendly vibe between him and his guests. The first two are smile and touch. What I like about Graham is that he reads his guest's body language and calibrates his touch based on what he sees. Check out this clip where he greets Josh Whittacombe with a handshake and Jeremy Renner with a hug. When we talk about touch, we often get asked, what if I'm not comfortable hugging? I think this handshake is a great example of what to do. Graham gives a handshake, a pat on the back, and a pat on the shoulder, all in the span of just two seconds. The third element Graham uses. So you guys have heard, that know my history know that when I was at Best Buy, I was the number one uh, TV salesperson in the whole company. And they, they had the executives come watch me on the mezzanine and to watch me what, and to see what I did. And afterwards, they kind of debriefed me on what they saw. They said, saw that the one thing that I did is I touched all my customers. I touched all my customers, almost like he did. Uh, it was on, the, on their forearm, on their shoulder, on their back, uh, you know, upper back. I mean, I touched them, and they said that I always got them laughing or I was laughing as well. Those are things that I did to sell a ton of TVs. And so this is the first thing that Graham does, which is to touch people. So, um, and not just a handshake. But you see how the hand went up, touch the shoulder, little pat. Uh, uh, there is a ton of science behind that when you touch somebody appropriately, obviously in today's world, um, it really it, it really skyrockets your their like uh, your likability in their eyes. And that's from waitresses to talk show hosts to TV salesmen. The science has shown that when you are able to touch somebody appropriately, that that uh, the like goes up significantly. There we go. To create the warm, friendly connection is he compliments based on accomplishment. 
This will ah compliments based on accomplishment. So where do we use that, guys? How do we use that? We have a name for it. Yeah, what part of God's? What part of God's? Come on, guys. There, Marsha's got it. Nick's got it. Come on, I need more people. Marsha's got it, yep. Mike's got it. Awesome, Mike. Ooh, you're making me sad. Guys, what are the, yeah, ape, Mark, Mark, ape. What's the, So what part of ape, Mark, are we talking about here? The E, exactly, Tom, the empowering. So when we empower somebody, we find something to give them sincere and honest appreciation from, you know, from Dale Carnegie, give sincere and honest appreciation. So it's not, um, and he's going to just make the point too, but remember I said flattery is what? Oh, you're smart, you're smart, you're smart, you're smart, when, or you're pretty, you're pretty, you're pretty, you're pretty. How do people feel when you just give them vague compliments like that? Most people don't like it. So instead, you find something in particular you can give them credit for. Isn't that what I uh, teach with empowering, where you're going to say, boy, you know that, you just realized that answer you gave me, you just realized things that I probably asked 30 people in the last month, and two of them knew that. So I don't know if you've got uh, uh, training in this. I don't know if you've done a lot of reading on this. I don't know if it's just instinctual, but you, you nailed it. That's amazing. I should have you talk to all my clients, because so few of them realize that answer. And that, and that answer is not really that easy to come by. So the fact that you dug it out or realized it or could see, see the, the forest for the trees, that uh, kudos to you. <laughs> kudos to you. So whatever you're doing, keep doing it because that is awesome. So am I, am, I, did, did, am I just basically saying they're brilliant or am I saying that one particular thing was a brilliant answer? That one particular answer they gave me was a brilliant answer. Was I just being general or was I giving them a specific thing to compliment them on? Very specific. When you do it that way, when you do it, give them a compliment on something specific, it's, they appreciate it. So I'm going to back it up a little bit because he's going to make the same point. So all the things that we t I teach you guys, Graham's doing as well. Uh, very successful. So here we go. Connection is he compliments based on accomplishment. This will become very important in a minute when we talk about how to tease someone and get them to laugh about it. At Tom Middleton, University, have you, have you had any bad reviews? No. Uh... <laughs> make a man feel good, Graham. Notice how Graham Norton focuses on compliments based around something you've worked hard to achieve. Remember that the goal of giving a compliment is to make the other person feel good. Just a couple of months ago, there you were, Wembley Stadium, uh, 90,000 people, broke Skybox office records, showed in 140 countries, world heavyweight champion beating Vladimir Klitschko. I mean, it's an incredible, incredible achievement. I mean, thank you. Very Complimenting your favorite actor generically by saying, Tom Hiddleston, you're awesome, isn't going to make him nearly as happy as specifically complimenting him on the craft he's worked for years to hone. By using a warm smile, calibrated touch, and compliments based on accomplishment, Graham creates a very friendly vibe almost instantly. This is a super important foundation to lay, but if this were all you did, you'd have a lot of people fairly lukewarm on you and not a lot of people clamoring to hang out with you again. That's where Graham's second step really helps out. He uses humor and laughter to make the other person feel joy around him. So much of what so now you said, uh, you know, he said smile, smile and humor, laughter. And, and Missy, you can get on the, the phone. When I was doing 21 point checklist, even though we were pointing out that their guy was screwing them, how much laughter did you hear coming out of the room? There's lots of laughter, lots of interaction, lots of laughter. So guys, Many advisors don't want to have fun with their clients because they think that's not professional. I got to be serious. I got to be professional. We're, are we delivering good news or bad news at these meetings at the 21 point checklist? Good news or bad news to them? Yeah, bad news. So when you find ways to lighten it up a bit, lighten it up. And I hear I mean, some of you guys are just so naturally good at this, but many of you do need some, uh, you need to, 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 mellow out and have a better time in front of it. You can, uh, uh, you can deliver very good news, have them discover these things without being so serious. And it's not going to hurt 
the uh, the message. They're going to still realize that guy's screwing them, but they're going to like you that much more. So here we go. What drives human action is ultimately just the pursuit of happiness and pleasure. When we find something that makes us happy, we want more of it. And two very quick ways to create happiness in someone are to make them laugh and to make them feel like you get them. Graham is excellent at using a wide range of vocal tonality and emotional expression to get a laugh, even when the words he's... So that's the other thing I stress as much. Guys, when you listen to me, do I always talk at the same tone, same volume, same speed, do, uh, or is it all over the place? It's all over the place. That's how you tell stories. That's how you get, pe that's how you get people to listen to what you're saying. So, and, and he's going to give some great examples of how Graham does that. Saying aren't necessarily funny. Watch how Will Smith and Toby Jones react to this simple sentence. There. <laughs> Here's another quick example. His lines don't seem like much, but watch the reaction he gets from the couch. Most of it's uh, CGI arrows, um, so that it can fire fast and do all that stuff and do things that are... Uh, but I can you fire a lot of arrows. A lot of arrows, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, must, I mean, I know it sounds... I don't miss, But man. it must be quite tiring. I mean, you're, <laughs> you're constantly not <laughs> <out> that hard. <laughs> <Really? laughs> now, imagine if he had just said, that's a lot of arrows. No one would laugh, but by using big gestures and moving your voice up and down in pitch to emphasize your point, you can have people in stitches. Some of my drinks. No, because oh, it's, no, it's one of those stupid games. You'll punch me. <laughs> <laughs> but Grant. See, that's the thing. I, many of us I don't have the gift of being funny. I am not a funny person. I cannot tell a joke. But uh, often I get people laughing, not because of some joke, but, but of what Graham's doing here, which is you find something they say and you're able to make a gesture or uh, uh, or bounce it back and allow them to be funny so you can both laugh. So when you're relaxed and you know the scripts, you can you can relax into what's happening and look for those little opportunities to add a little levity in. And again, Graham's not telling jokes. I don't tell jokes. He's just reacting to what people have said and allowing them to be the star, allowing them to be funny. Graham's greatest skill might be laughing along with someone else's joke. Watch him lose it after Mark Ruffalo takes a dig at Josh Widdicombe here. Josh, what are you afraid What are you afraid of? Well, I was going to go with flying, but I think I'll go with... Um, Girls six. over 12? <laughs> He's just so good-natured. He laughs a lot, which makes him fun to be around, and it makes other people feel good around him. This is a skill that is hugely overlooked. When you laugh at someone else's joke, you make them feel like you're listening to them, and you make them feel like you get them. If this is something you want to get better at, I recommend watching a wide variety of comedies. Watch improv shows, stand up, and don't laugh challenges on YouTube, and find what makes you laugh. Don't multitask and distract yourself from it. Spend at least an hour a week watching things that make you laugh out loud. Over time, you'll find yourself laughing out loud more and more as those neural pathways get reinforced over time. As someone who used to take everything in life very seriously, I know firsthand that laughter and happiness are habits. And the more you can cultivate that habit, the happier you'll be and the more people will enjoy being around you. Because Graham Norton interviews three or four people at a time, he needs to be able to make his guests like him while spending more time listening than speaking. By smiling, touching, and laughing, you can create really positive feelings towards you while saying very little. Now, another thing worth pointing out is that Graham Norton is not dealing with normal people. He is interviewing the biggest movie stars and athletes on the planet, so they can sometimes be difficult to connect with or difficult to open up. That's where Graham's third step comes in. He uses teasing and self-deprecation to get everyone on the same level. Clark, who cares? You know, <laughs> Your sensible yeah. shoes, who cares? <laughs> Playful teasing is what we do in our most intimate relationships. If you think of close family members and friend groups or even romantic relationships, most of them involve playfully giving each other a hard time. If you can effectively jump into this type of humor early on in a relationship, you immediately create a much more familiar feeling between the two of you. This is one of the biggest reasons why Graham's guests are so laid back on the show. It's hard to be uptight when you're cracking up laughing while somebody teases you. As an example, here he is teasing Elizabeth Olsen about her role on The Avengers. So you're just going... There's a lot of 
questionable. <laughs> but I've got a picture of you doing it without the special effects, and you're right, it is... It's yes. not... Even Jeremy Renner, Jeremy Renner oh is really God. unimpressed. You <laughs> say this woman's fleeing for her life. <laughs> This is a dangerous type of joke to make because it can easily be confused with putting someone down. But Graham avoids that by keeping it light. He wasn't teasing something core to Elizabeth, like her acting skills. He's simply poking fun at a silly pose. The two rules to keep in mind are don't attack someone's identity and don't tease something that is both unchangeable and important to them. Teasing someone is not the same as insulting them and it should make the person laugh. Look at this clip with David Beckham, for example. This one... Okay, what was going on here? <laughs> yeah, that was, that was maybe a bad decision. Graham is teasing David's past haircut, which is a completely changeable feature. And since Beckham is a well-known sex symbol who has literally won People's Sexiest Man Alive Award, it's a safe and funny joke that they can both laugh at. Going back to the example with Elizabeth Olsen, there's another important factor at play. This was around the release of Avengers Age of Ultron, where Elizabeth was playing a starring role in one of the biggest movies of the year. Graham even compliments the movie earlier in the interview. It is terrific. They've done such a good job with this movie. Uh, people will not be disappointed. It's just fantastic. By starting with such a sincere compliment, Graham has established that he liked the movie, which sets the stage for him to be able to tease little things without offending anyone. Here's another example of grounding your teasing with a compliment with heavyweight boxing champion Anthony Joshua. We've got a, a, a still of when, he, when you slipped. Um, <laughs> You can see the position I'm in that woof. Yeah. But I mean, look, obviously there's some, there's some water there. I think. And, uh, <laughs> look at how hard Anthony Joshua is laughing there. How is Grant Norton able to tease him about being knocked down without upsetting him? It's simple. 20 seconds earlier, he praised him very heavily and sincerely, and it's a fight that Anthony won, so he isn't sensitive about it. It also helps that Graham delivers a jab. He says it with a smile, laughing, and an upbeat tone. We've all been burned by the guy that takes a jab at us without smiling or laughing, and it feels totally different. This goes back to the point. So, do you see the importance? He's making a point that if you, in his, uh, in our terms, empower somebody, get on their side, tell them why they're above average. Does that? I mean, he's pointing out if you do that, you can actually poke a little fun at them uh, later on. I'm not going to recommend that. That's a very, <laughs> you know, these are people that we've just met. That's a hard skill. We don't want to. Uh, 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 worry about trying to poke fun at them. If you find an easy way to do it, sure, but that's not that's not what we want to do. But think about that. Because if you can poke fun of them, that's the power of empowering them. If you empower them and you can poke fun of them, it works. Just think, uh, when I want you to empower, I want you to empower early in the meeting as possible so you put some positive energy in the bank so they love you. I want you to empower when they make a point for us, because when they make a point for us and you empower them, that locks it in. I want you to empower people. When the meeting gets a little rough, you maybe uh, have corrected them too many times accidentally, or for whatever reason, they're getting a little bit standoffish. If you find the nearest opportunity to empower them, it brings them right back to your side. It makes them like you again. So if, if because it, 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 what he's saying is if you, and again, in our terms, empower somebody, compliment them about something specifically, if you can go ahead and poke fun of them afterwards and it works, and we're not, we're not poking fun, we're doing much, something much less aggressive than that, just think how well empowering works. Do you get that? Empowering is such a, a huge tool. Number one, use it as early in the meeting as possible to put some positive energy in the bank. Number two, empower them uh, whenever they make a point for us, because when they make a point for us, it locks that in forever. And then empower them uh, when the things are getting a little bit rough or you think you've made some mistakes, they're getting a little standoffish, look for the nearest opportunity to empower them because it will make them like you again. So the empowering is so, 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 so uh, powerful. Don't be a jerk. Don't say something out of malice or dislike for someone. Whoever you're teasing should be laughing along with you. Now, if you forget to slip a compliment into the conversation and happen to tease someone before thinking of it, there is another way to keep the conversation fun and funny for everyone. And that is with a self-deprecating joke. Here's an example from Graham. Are you from New Zealand as well? No, I'm from Basingstoke. Oh. <laughs> I have a great ear. Uh, a really great ear. It's funny, and it also isn't a huge put-down. The joke isn't that he's a huge loser. He's actually just acknowledging what everyone else has already started laughing at, which is that he botched where she's from. By occasionally teasing yourself as well, you're showing that it's all in fun and that you aren't actually attacking anyone. 
This creates an atmosphere where everyone is on the same team and laughing together. There is no in-crowd versus out-crowd dynamic. Watch as Graham puts it all together while promoting X-Men First Class. He starts off early in the interview with something nice. Yeah, but, here's, but here's the exciting thing. All three of the men also appeared on Empire's Sexiest Man of the Year poll. <laughs> then he puts them into a funny and awkward spot by making them guess where they rank against each other. I'm going to be humble. I'm going to see last. And you're uh, right. He doesn't know. <laughs> Now, James McAvoy could feel a bit of a sting here, although it turned out he ranked 16th Sexiest Man Alive out of 100 potential celebrities, so he's probably not hurting too badly about it. But watch how Graham softens it even further a minute later. Where were you? Hmm? Where, Where were you, picture? Graham? I was at home reading. <laughs> Between the early compliment and the joke at his own expense, it'd be hard for James to be upset at Graham right now. One quick word of caution here, don't make yourself the butt of every joke. The same rules apply when teasing yourself as when teasing someone else. By combining achievement-based compliments the person is proud of, playful teases, and self-deprecating jokes, you can tease people while they laugh and love you for it. The last thing Graham Norton does fantastically that really endears him to people is he listens very intently. He speaks, pay attention to this, guys. Pay attention. He listens very intently. So he asks questions and then he lets the other person talk. Much less host. Instead, guiding the conversation, jumping in with jokes when he sees the opportunity, and mostly letting the stars do the talking. Watch how he asks a question, makes everyone laugh, and then stops being goofy and becomes very focused on listening intently. I read unusually, as an actor, you, you negotiated, you lobbied for extra nudity. <laughs> I'm trying to sell the film, Tom. <laughs> gothic romance, how are you? Well, uh, hello. Uh, no, they, they, well, you know, gothic romance is it's about sexuality. It's about it has to be sexy, and uh, there is a, a love scene in the film. <laughs> One of my favorite authors, Dale Carnegie, wrote: "To be interesting, be interested, especially once you've got them laughing and feeling like you're someone who is a joy to be around. The people you're talking to will really value your attention." Listen to how Graham asks this next question and watch his eye contact, facial expressions, and gesticulation. There's a real sense of genuine interest. Because you were the same. You worked when you were very young, didn't you? You were on set as a... Letting someone talk and share while making them feel listened to can be an incredible experience for them. And there you have it. There's obviously a lot more that you can do in a conversation to make someone... So, you, you'll, if you ever watch him, you'll notice he's never in a hurry to get to the next joke or the next topic. He'll let people go on. And that's the, those are things that we can all uh, learn from. Oops, I have to get to the next screen here. There we go. So that's four ways of being, uh, getting, uh, being liked better. Number one, uh, friendly touches. Number two, uh, li li we just saw, listen intently. Number three, empower them. Empower them about something specific. Uh, and, and number four, laugh. Laugh and smile, laugh and smile, laugh and smile. Those are ways to get people to like you. So now we're going to talk a little bit more on a, on a different topic, which is three behaviors to stop, which will enhance your professional performance by doing less. This is going to help you uh, become a more effective, efficient person. So number, the three things are working on uh, stop working on low priorities, stop multitasking, and stop talking too much. Well, we just talked about stop talking too much. We got we got to listen to them. Uh, other people, not talk to other people. So uh, let's talk, talk about stop working on low priorities. Andrew Carnegie, the steel magnet, was the fourth richest person who's ever lived, not in the U.S., who's ever lived. Scottish immigrant came to the uh, U.S. at 12, started working at an early age, and he uh, built a, a railroad a, a career in railroad and also in steel and iron. So this guy was the, the wealthiest person in the world. And when he was at his height, he hired this Frederick Winslow Taylor, who's a mechanical engineer, to come in and help him be more efficient. Help him be more efficient. Does anybody know this story? What did Frederick Winslow Taylor tell uh, An Andrew uh, Carnegie to do? Does anybody know? He told him something. He said, wrap up the day and plan tomorrow. Yeah, close, Tom. Yeah, I would, and you may be getting it right. It's uh, maybe uh, um, 
uh, communicating in, in a way that's not as uh, exactly what I'm looking for. So what he said is write down the 10 things that you need to get done today. Every day, you, first thing in the, and when you walk in to your office that morning, write down the 10 things that you need to get done. Now, that's not earth shattering, but there was something that was earth shattering. What was the next piece of advice that he gave them? Work, uh, that's right, Nick, prioritize. Rank them in the order of priority and, when, and work on which one? Number one, number two, number three, number four, which one? Work on number one. And when will you go on to number two? Not till number one is done. Not till number one is done. And a week later, Frederick Taylor came back and Andrew Carnegie gave him $10,000. He gave him the $10,000 uh, because Andrew, Frederick Taylor said, if I can improve your life significantly, will you pay me $10,000? And that's the only advice he gave me. He was in the office for five minutes, came back a week later, and Andrew Carnegie gave him $10,000. He felt that that was such uh, a, a, a uh, important or powerful suggestion. And think about that. How often do we do that in our lives. I mean, it seems simple. Write down the 10 things you need to get done a day, prioritize, and don't work on number one. I mean, sorry, don't work on number two or any of the others until you get number one done. How many of us can say that we do that on a regular, on, you know, on a daily basis? I know I don't, because we tend to do what? Whatever's in front of us, that's what we do. And most importantly, even when we're working on the most important thing, what do we tend to want to do? Even when we're working on the most important thing, what do we tend to do? I'm as bad as anybody else. What do we want to do? Wander how? We're going to get to the, this actually weaves into the next thing. Yeah, you want to look at uh, emails. You want to answer the phone. You want to go get coffee. You don't want to just sit there and focus and get that one thing done. So the the if you want to get a ton of things done and be effective, write down a list of the 10 things you need to get done every day. And then the author of this article from Financial uh, Professional uh, Service Professionals, he uh, actually read these uh, four books, which I've uh, read as well, How to Win Friends and Influence People, Seven uh, Habits of Highly Effective People, Thinking, Grow Rich, and The Profit. These are books that I have, I've read several times, each of them. And uh, the author actually came up with, with uh, I thought was, uh, encapsulating the four things you need to do to be effective. So to get things done, number one, make a list of the things you need to get done first thing in the morning. Of course, the first thing you get after, what are you, you going to do before you make that list? It's right there on the screen. Everybody answer this. What are you going to do before you make that list? Nick's got it. Come on, everybody. Yeah, that 15-minute drill. 15 minutes. Then make your list. Then reorder the list in order of priority. What is the most important thing you need to do today? Then look at the rest of the list and see what can I eliminate? What really do, do I not need to do? What can I delegate to somebody else? What can I delay until tomorrow or a week from now? Cross them off the list. Then start working on task number one and do not work on anything else till it is done. That means no emails. That means no phones. Turn off your phone. It means no unnecessary conversations. Tell your staff. Don't bug me till I get this thing done. If you do that, you're going to magically get a lot more things done, especially the important things. They're going to make you a better uh, person, a better professional, and more money. Make a list. Reorder and lower priority. Eliminate, delegate, or delay any of those items. And then work on number one and do not go on to number two until number one is done. That means no emails, no phones, no unnecessary time, no nothing. Turn off the doggone phone. Turn off the email. In fact, email, you should be looking at your email how often a day? I would say in the morning, after your 15-minute drill and after doing this little list, at noon and before you go home. That's it. That's it. And then what should you have? Uh, what should you have done with email in between those times? If you have Outlook, what should you do with Outlook? Turn it off. Don't even tempt yourself. Don't ignore it. Turn it off. Because do most of us have the willpower to ignore it? Turn it off. Turn it off. Turn it off. 
How long does it take to reopen it once you want to look at it at noon or before lunch or after lunch? 30 seconds? So turn it off and then just turn it on when you want to look at it. And then when you're done, turn it off again. Are you, are you getting emails that need to be answered within minutes of getting them? I mean, how often do you get an email where it has to be answered within minutes of you getting it? How often does that happen? Often or not often? Not. And if they really need to get a hold of you, guess what they can do? If they email you and they really need to get a hold of you and you're not getting back, what will they do? Pick up the phone. They'll call you. Or the texture. Exactly. Second thing, do not multitask. What has science told us about multitasking? Can the human brain multitask? Has a human brain been in existence that can multitask? No. I mean, can you really uh, uh, um, do math and watch a movie at the same time? We can't. We cannot multitask. A great example of this is um, Kaiser Permanente, which is, as those of you out of uh, West know, is a huge um, healthcare uh, um, entity. And they actually um, have a center for innovation. So the Garfield Innovation Center, and they're trying to make medicine better. They're trying to make medicine better in all sorts of things. They do all sorts of experience, or experiments. They all do all sorts of tests and research. So one of the things they wanted to correct was medication error. They found that nurses were, were making a, a large amount of errors when doing medication, which means over-prescribing, giving them too high a dose, giving them too low a dose, giving them the wrong drug. And essentially, guess what they found out? You think it was the nurse's fault? Well, yes and no. What did they find out? Why were the nurses making this mistake? Because as they were doing that, what was happening to them? People were coming up to them and asking them questions. They were asking, did you get this done? Can you help me when you're done there? Can you do this? Can you do that? Can, but they, were, they weren't overloaded. They weren't overloaded. They were, they were being bugged. They were, they were being asking to be, people were bothering them while they were doing this. They were distracted. That's the best word for it. Yep, distracted. So the fix to this, I mean, and, and, and uh, again, there was, you know, it wasn't like 50% a, a of the time they were doing this. It was, it was a, a small percentage, but that small percentage, guess how expensive that was for the hospital? That small percentage of when they got the, the, the prescriptions wrong or the drugs wrong, it was huge. It was hugely costly because people died. People had to spend more time in the hospital. People, uh, the hospital was sued. So they needed to fix, they wanted to take it from a small percentage to what? <laughs> a much even smaller percentage. And the fix, guess what the fix cost them? 10 bucks. So the fix cost them 10 bucks. And here's what the fix was. They bought a sash. And when the nurse was wearing that sash, what did that tell everybody around her? What did that tell everybody around her when the nurse put that sash on? Don't talk to her. Stay back. Leave her alone. In fact, then they painted a circle uh, when she was doing that. And so when she had the sash on in the circle, nobody could come within that 10-foot circle. Nobody was allowed to set foot in that 10-foot circle. Guess what that did for Kaiser Permanente? The mistakes went to basically nil because where was the nurse's focus? I mean, actually prescribing the right drug is not that difficult. It's a, here's the drug name. Here's how many milligrams. It's not that difficult. The difficulty was trying to do that and other things at the same time. So when the nurse, when the nurses were not bugged and they were in that circle, and also think about it, what did that tell the nurse when they put that sash on? What did that tell that nurse when she stepped into that circle? As well, what did that tell her? Now's my time. That's right. To focus, focus, focus. Their 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 uh, uh, um, miss prescriptions or uh, 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 incorrect prescriptions went down to virtually nil with that little $10 focus. So quit multitasking. Quit multitasking. Because multi MIT neuroscience proved that our brains aren't built for uh, multitasking. 
We tend to like to do things that give us dopamine, that is, answer emails and texts, and this creates a bad habit. That's why I remember we started talking about uh, ranking things in order of priority. We find it hard to just finish that one thing before we move on to the next thing or do something else. Why? Because we love the little, we hear the ding on our phone. We hear the ding on our computer. What do we immediately want to do? Go look at email. Go look at our text. You need to what? I mean, how many people, how many accidents in this country are caused by people who cannot ignore the ding on their cell phone and look at the text while they're driving? That ding, the reason we want to look at the email, the reason we want to look at the text, the reason we want to pick up the phone when it rings is we get a little shot of dopamine every time we do that because we're like, who's on the other side? It's, it's got to be something good. It's got to be something interesting. You got to stop doing that. Turn and, and you know what? Don't just ignore it. Turn it off. Multitasking also lowers the quality and efficiency of work. The more difficult, it's, it's more difficult to organize work and weed out the irrele irrelevant info. So if you're multitasking, you're not organizing what you're doing very well. And you don't know what immediately what to, to ignore and what to pay more attention to. The study at the University of London proved it lowers your IQ to the equivalent of us losing a night's sleep or being high on weed. When you're multitasking, that means your ability to think, to be efficient, to be smart about what you're doing is lowered by the equivalent of losing a night's sleep or being high on weed. Guys, if that's the case, and it's been proven by very uh, prominent uh, researchers, how often should we be multitasking? And again, multitasking doesn't mean doing, uh, doing a, uh, a, a proposal for a client and uh, two clients at, at the same time. No, multitasking is doing a proposal for a client and then also doing what? Yeah, email, answering the phone, looking at text. When you're doing your work, you're doing that number one on your priority list, turn off all of the other distractions. Remember, the nurse wasn't trying to, to do an operation and prescribe medication and change a bedpan at the same time. She was doing one thing, but she was distracted. She was distracted. It's, so multitasking is not, most of us aren't going to try to do two projects at one time. But what many of us, you know, it drives me crazy when I would watch my sons in high school and they'd be doing their math and they would have their freaking uh, uh, laptop open and a, and a bud, an earbud in their ear. So they're doing their math and then they're watching YouTube videos and they're listening to music. How long did it take them to do their homework? 20 minutes of homework turned into two freaking hours. And how good was the quality of the work? Well, I don't get this. This math is hard. No shit. <laughs> when you're watching YouTube videos and you're, and you're uh, listening to music at the same time you're doing math, guess what math is going to be? Hard. So, guys, pay attention to t a task till it's done. Don't multitask. So how do we stop doing that? Put it out of sight. Out of sight. Put your phone away. Turn off Outlook. And then the other thing they recommend is Ohio. Only handle it once. So when you're looking at a, uh, uh, when you're looking at your text or you're looking at your emails, don't put it into folder to talk about it later. Just what? If it's important, what should you do? So when you're looking at it in the morning, or you're looking at it at noon, or you're looking at it before you go home at night, when you see something that needs to be taken care of, guess what? Take care of it. Don't don't set it aside so you can do it later. Just do it right then and there if it's that important. If it's not important, then guess what? If it's not important. Guess what? Don't do it. Don't do it. Okay? So, re uh, reducing these three behaviors increases productivity. Working on low priorities, stop doing that. Multitasking and then talking too much. And this is something we talk about every single week. Ask open ended questions, don't talk too much. In fact, what do they say? <laughs> um, the, the, I can't remember the actual quote and who, who you actually quoted, but they said, the way he looks intelligent, the way he said, I look intelligent is what? How do I look intelligent? And you're in a room with a bunch of people, yeah. You shut up because if I open my mouth, all of a sudden what? Now people will know I'm not as smart as I thought I was. So the best way to be smart is to shut up and let other people do the talking. Because as soon as you open your mouth, guess what? Now they're going to find out how smart you actually are. And it's usually not as smart as we think we are. So what else can we get better at getting better at? 
learning how to memorize. So this is out of the American Psychological Association, a powerful way to improve learning and memory. Practicing retrieval enhances long-term meaningful learning. So in recent advances in science of learning and memory have challenged common assumptions about how uh, uh, learning uh, happens. Specifically, recent work has shown that the retrieval is critical for robust, doable, or durable long-term learning. Every time a memory is retrieved, that memory becomes more accessible in the future. So what you've heard me probably talk about is that the more times you remember something, the more that neural pathway gets strengthened. It gets thickened. It, it, it becomes more permanent. So the more times you recall something, the more that neural pathway gets strengthened so you're able to recall it uh, uh, at, a, at some future uh, time. Retrieval also helps people create coherent, integrated mental representations of complex concepts. So it's not just rem remembering something. It also helps them remember complex concepts. So guys, a lot of guys will ask me, why do you have clients repeat things three or four times? Why do I have them? Based on this, guys, why do I have them repeat it three or four times? The things that we're presenting to them, are they complicated? Not to us, but to them. We do it all day long. They don't do it every day. So it's complicated. The reason I have them do it three or four times is so that they, these complex concepts get, uh, form a deep uh, 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 connection in their brain. The deep learning necessary to solve new problems and draw new inferences. Are we, try, are we having them draw new inferences about their current situation in a 21-point checklist? What's the inference we're having them draw at a 21-point checklist? Come on, guys. This should be as easy. That's right. Nick's got it. Come on, everybody else. Yep, everybody's getting their Their guy is taking advantage of them. That's exactly right. So this approach recognizes the central role of retrieval process and learning aims to develop new strategies based on retrieval practice. So uh, they did an experiment, a word learning experiment, uh, illustrates key points about retrieval-based learning. In the experiment, students learned a list of foreign lear uh, words, Swahili in this uh, example, across cycles of study and recall trials. In study trials, the students saw a vocabulary word and its translation on the computer screen. And in the recall trials, they saw a vocabulary word and had to recall the type of the translation. So basically memorizing foreign words. So what did they find out? They found out that the, um, they did several different uh, uh, conditions. One, of course, was just simply students uh, studied the words once without trying to recall them at all. How did that work, you think? <laughs> In a second condition, students continued studying and recalling the words until they had recalled them at least once. After a word was success successfully retrieved once, it was dropped from further practice, so they only learned it one time. The other conditions, the experiment examined and repeated uh, retrieval practice. Once a word was recalled, the computer program required the students to practice retrieving the item three more times. One way they did it was one after another after another. And the other way they did it is uh, uh, by sporadically, once you've learned at one time, they would sporadically have you do it another time and another time at varied times in the future. So once the student correctly recall translation, the program moved to other vocabulary words, but prompt to practice retrieval and translation uh, would pop up later in the program. And this way the retrieval opportunities were spaced throughout the learning session. So which way do you think uh, uh, not recalling them at all, recalling them once, recalling them and then doing it three times in a row, or recalling them once and then sporadically. Yeah, the last way was the best way. So study it once, virtually no recall. Recall once was the same as mass recall. There was no real difference. In fact, the recall once seemed a tiny bit better than repeated mass. It was the repeated spacing and remembering. So when you think about how we teach you to learn the scripts, Remember how we did it. We learned line, we learned the first part, right? Then we record ourselves and critique ourselves. Did we learn it? Then we'll go learn the second part. Then we'll uh, record ourselves and critique ourselves. We don't move forward till we get it. And then do we go to the third or do we go back and do one and two together before we go on to number three? We do one and two together. That's a sporadic, cause, uh, right? Now we learn number three. Then we do one, two, three. Then we do learn number four and do one, two, three, four. Are we using sporadic? A repeated spacing to learn when we do that. That is the best way to learn it. That is the best way to learn it. So now when they asked college uh, kids, how do you memorize, how do you study? The vast majority of them said that they reread the text. They reread it, reread it, reread it. In our example, that would be rereading scripts. That's why I actually removed scripts from our, our uh, uh, we removed, I removed hand or um, uh, uh, the text scripts so guys wouldn't just read it, read it, read it. That's worthless. That's worthless. So is watching the video over and over and over again. The best way to do it is watch the video, stop it, record yourself, critique yourself, 
If you didn't get it right, do it again. That's the best way to learn it. That's the best way to learn it. But most college kids, that's way down, way down on on how they actually study. So most college kids are studying the 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 basically in worthless ways as compared to the best way. So practice retrieval promotes meaningful learning. Perhaps another reason retrieval practice is not used more widely is because it's repeated retrieval may seem like rote learning. Rote learning, simply memorization based on repetition, is short-lived, poorly organized, and does not support the ability to transfer knowledge, making inferences or to solve new problems. That's what people think, but guess what they found out? Rote is actually what? Good. Meaningful learning is essentially the opposite of rote learning. Even though you're doing using what's uh, called rote learning, which doing it over and over and over again, it is long lasting and durable. Well, actually, they're saying here's what they're saying with rote learning. Rote learning is to just read the list, read the list, read the list, try to learn over and over and over. Um, uh, effective retrieval means that you actually don't just read things over and over and over again. You'll you'll actually force yourself to retrieve them. Force yourself to think, what is that thing? What am I looking for? What am I supposed to say in our particular case? So it's, it is long-lasting, durable, coherent, and well-organized, supports transfer, inferencing, and problem solving. So retrieval-based learning may be a more effective means of, oops, I get it. Uh, um, so guys, the reason I'm showing you this is because this is gonna help you learn and memorize things. Students studied educational texts about science topics using one of two strategies. Either number one, in retrieval practice conditions, the students read a text, then they set the text aside, and they spent time recalling it and writing it down as much as possible. Is that what I ask you to do when you learn the scripts, guys? Watch the video, turn the video off, and then record yourself. Or write it down if you want to write it down sometimes as well. That's okay. Now, the second way they did it is uh, in a second condition, students created concept maps. You know those little mind maps that we were, some of us are taught when we're studying? So you write that as you're as you're listening to it, you start writing down the script or you start writing mind maps. Concept maps are a node and link diagrams that require learners to think about the relational organizational structure of the materials. The students spent the same amount of time studying the two conditions. Here's the amazing thing that happened. They then asked them a short, uh, they gave them a short answer uh, quiz and they gave them a, uh, concepts. They wanted them to draw the concepts out. So the Obviously, the retrieval practice, they did better at taking the quiz, right? Better than the concept, because they were actually being forcing their brain to create those neural pathways, strengthen the neural pathways over and over. And the, the more times they retrieved, the, the more strong the, the um, neural pathways were, the more they're going to remember. But here's the funny thing. When they wanted them to do a concept map, remember, these, group, these guys studied via concept map. These guys studied via concept map. But the retrieval actually allowed people <laughs> allowed the students to even surpass the the concept map people in concept mapping. Does that make sense? So when they add part of the second part of the test uh, for retrieval or for um, uh, testing their knowledge of of what they remembered was to do a concept map. The people who did not do concept maps but instead used the retrieval concept actually did better on creating concept maps after the fact than the people who tried to learn via concept map because they remembered more things. And not only did they remember it, as they're remembering it, these neural pathways started to connect and how these things fit together as well. Does that make sense? It even, <laughs> so I'm making that some point right there. So take home points about retrieval-based learning. Retrieval is a learning event. Making yourself go back and remember what you just saw is a learning event, not just for what you're supposed to say, but how it fits together. Practical retrieving is a simple and effective way to enhance long-term meaningful learning. Some effective learning strategies like retrieval practice are underutilized. Conversely, the most popular learning strategy among college students is repetitive reading. So just watching a video over and over and over or reading a script over and over is worthless. When practice retrieval, retrieval more than once, space your uh, retrievals, rather than massing them all together. So that's what we talked about, where we're doing, we learn one, then we learn two, then we go back to one and two, then we learn three, we go one, two, three, then we learn four, we do one, two, three, four. So you're spacing those. Retrieval can happen in a variety of ways. Many existing activities may be converted into retrieval-based learning activities. The key ingredient is to spend time actively retrieving. The more you force your brain to remember something, the more it's gonna stick. I know that seems 
like sec like the common sense, but you just saw that most people won't do the work necessary. Why don't they want to do that? Why do you think um, most college students and most people want to do it these ways instead, rather than practice recall? Why do they want to do this these ways instead of practice recall? It requires less thinking. It's easier. Exactly right. It's easier. It doesn't require them to use their brain as much. So the other thing to, to and this is fan, this is unbelievable. This this is brand new news to me. This this blew me out of the water. The only uh, you only need to make one small change to learn any new skill twice as fast. Johns Hopkins research shows. Not only will you learn a lot faster, practicing will be a lot more fun. So it matters how you practice. Most people focus on repetition, simply repeating the same moves over and over and over, like endlessly playing the scales on piano or going through the same list of vocabulary words over and over again, or doing uh, anything over and over and over again, and I hope you get better at that task. But that's a problem. Do that, and in some cases, your skill may improve early on, but eventually, they've found that it will start to get worse. If you keep practicing the thing over and over and over, eventually you start to get worse. And they, and they went through all sorts of things from piano to sports to doctors that if you just practice the same skill over and over and over, you're going to reach a peak, and then the peak starts to go down. Uh, even if that doesn't happen, you won't be able to improve your skills as quickly as you could. What we found is if you practice a slightly modified version of the task you want to master, you actually learn more and faster than if you just keep practicing the exact same thing multiple times over. Here's a simple example. Working to improve your ability to shoot a basketball free throws, the conditions are fixed. The rim is 10 feet above the floor. The free throw line is 15 away from the basket. So in theory, shooting from the same spot over and over and again, you will help you ingrain the right motions into your muscle memory for accuracy and consistency. And it should improve. That approach does work, but they found a better and faster way to improve is to slightly adjust the conditions in the subsequent practice session. So maybe one time you'll stand a few inches closer, then the next time a few inches back, maybe a little to the left, next time a little bit to the right. Another time you might stand, uh, um, uh, use a slightly heavier ball or a slightly lighter ball. Each time you practice, you make the conditions a tiny, not a huge difference. You don't want to go from a, a basketball to an eight-foot medicine ball, but you'd like to go from a, a, kid's, a, a kid's basketball to, a, to an adult basketball or a, you know, just slight differences. That will prime the reconsolidation pump and help you learn much more quickly. Now, if you think about it, that's another reason why you should, why instinctually not having you guys look at printed scripts was a good idea. Because when you watch the video, are you doing the scripts the exact same way the second time? Or are you coming up with maybe slightly different words? Or your brain is coming up with slightly different ways to ask those questions? That helps you learn it better. Now, I didn't mean to do that. I didn't mean for that to happen. But learning from the videos where you have to recall and kind of do it your own way, that's a good thing. So, but not too different or too soon. So as long as you only slightly adjust the difference to the conditions and change it up too much and you're going to create new memories, not reconsolidate the, the ones you're trying to lock in. If you make the ultra task too different, so going from a light basketball to an eight-pound medicine ball, people do not get, uh, get the gain we observe during the reconciliation. The modification between the sessions needs to be subtle, just a little bit different. Another key is to space out how your practice sessions uh, 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 um, appropriately. Research recommended taking six-hour break between training sessions. Neurological research indicates it takes that long for new memories to reconstruct. So which means that you so spend six hours between modifying a slight modification to the script. So one of the ways you could do this is use the who, what, why, why, when, how questions. So in the one time I'm going to use all the how questions. And then the next time I'll use questions to start with why. Next questions I'll say, I'm going to figure out how to do this with questions to ask for when. That will help you do just to uh, uh, train those questions, doing it slightly differently. Same questions, but starting with a slightly different uh, beginning word. Who, what, where, why, when, how. So that's a way that you could do that in our session. So how do you double, uh, how to double how quickly you learn? The key improvement is making small, smart changes, evaluating the results, discarding what doesn't work, and further refining what does work. When you constantly modify slightly, slightly modify, and refine something you already do, you can do it even better. So what this is saying is what? What if you've already mastered the 21-point checklist scripts? What does this say you can do? 
when you constantly modify and refine something you already do well, you can get even better. Say you want to improve a skill to make things simple, you pretend you want to make master a new presentation. These things work. Number one is rehearse the basic skill. Run through your presentation a couple of times under the same conditions you'll eventually face um, when you do it live. Naturally, the second time through it will be better than the first. That's how practice works. But then instead of doing it the, the third time, six hours later, give yourself six hours so your memory can consolidate what you already learned, which probably means waiting until the next day, but then you want to go through it again. But this time, maybe do it slightly faster or just do it slightly slower or break up your presentation into smaller parts or practice under different conditions using a different remote or a different lavalier or a head mic or switch up the conditions slightly. Not only will that modify your existing memory, it'll lock it in or make you better prepared for the unexpected. Turn off the lights. Turn the lights way up. Make the screen harder to see. These are all things. Practice it a little bit differently. And then the next time, modify it slightly again. You keep modifying and refining a skill you already do well, you can do it even better and a lot more quickly. That is the quickest path to gaining real expertise. That was that was brand new news to me, and, and Johns Hopkins showed that you can double how quickly you learn something by doing that, okay? So was this a helpful uh, coaching call to you guys? Learning to be liked, learning what to quit doing, and learning how to um, learn things quicker. Good. Good. I know there's a lot of packed in there, but um, I think that if you – I would watch this again, and I would watch it regularly to make sure you're doing these things until they become second nature. Super. So thanks for being on the call today. You guys all have a great rest of the weekend. We'll talk to you all Monday. Thanks, everybody.